All right, we're now in the last last third of this presentation, and we thought, um, at the very least, you now deserve some pretty colors because we will not be able to offer you any pictures. Can we move on to the next one? Um, the, the table that you see here is uh, half of that is a recap of what you've already seen during Verena's presentation, which is a color-coded summary, very basic summary <laughs> of PFM reform progress. The, the, the other column is a qualitative assessment of progress on wider state building, because the, the final third of, of, of what we're trying to present here today is sort of the, the answer, our very tentative answer to the so what question. Um, we, we've seen that there are some countries where progress on PFM reform was, was substantial. Does that make any difference in the, in the larger scheme of things apart from improving narrow technical PFM functionalities? Um, we broke this down into three salient and crucial areas which not just ourselves but also other people were particularly important to check for here and the first one of those is the relationship between PFM and state building. In, in, in a very basic sense this it's almost obvious that you would think you can't have a proper state without a functioning PFM system because so much of what being a modern state means has to do with having a functioning budget system, being able to collect taxes, being able to force tax collection out of your citizens if need be, and then being able to accountably, legitimately, and, and, and somewhat safely spend the money that you've collected. Um, and if you, if you look at this table, to some extent, this is actually borne out by the pattern that we find here. Generally, there's a, there's a pretty strong picture of, of, of congruence or correlation that, that the, the basically where you find yellow, red, or green on, on the one hand, you also find yellow, red, or green on the other hand, which, which is to say that if, you, if your PFM progress is good, then your state capacity is generally also good. There are um, important exceptions here. There are some countries where PFM progress far, far outpaced um, general state capacity as, as, as measured here. There are no instances where the general state capacity far, far outpaced the progress on PFM. And, 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 and these are quite significant. It's, it's perhaps not an accident, given what we heard this morning, that there's such a big and substantial difference between those two areas in the case of Afghanistan. Um, and it's, it's also noteworthy that the two middle-income countries newly independent or aspiring to be independent middle-income countries, which are Kosovo and West Bank and Gaza, are pretty much ahead of the pack in, 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 in terms of linking PFM reform and state building, because at least in the case of West Bank and Gaza, that was the predominant and very, very explicit motivation for the government to initiate PFM reforms and pursue them in spite of considerable political costs in the first place. Um, however, it's, it's difficult to, to sort of assume or, or assign notions of causality to this. It's, we, th there will be some sort of complex interrelationship between what happens in wider state building, wider administrative capacity on the one hand, and very narrow PFM capacity building on the other hand. It, it would not be proper to say that if you do PFM, state capacity will inevitably follow, or that you need a certain degree of state capacity as a, as a necessary condition to achieve a certain degree of PFM functionality. So one has to be very careful what to conclude from these uh, very small sample, um, mostly illustrative patterns. Uh, on to the, actually to the slide after this one, because that's what I just explained. And this brings us back very nicely to the discussion that we had throughout the morning session when we were talking about the role of capacity and the ability for, for donors but also for heads of government or centers of government to, to substitute capacity. Because one very simple explanation for why it is possible for, for, for governments to, to just march ahead with relatively complex PFM systems is in, in spite of a very weak fragmented state surrounding it that this is not actually endogenous. This is capacity that was brought in from the outside temporarily that allows countries to, to fulfill certain 
certain PFM functions, but the, the, the question inevitably and from relatively early on then becomes how do you transition from a situation of capacity substitution to one of endogenous capacity growth? And, and we, we didn't find the sort of m magic bullet type solution for this because it's, it's just a perennial concern that is very difficult to solve. Again, there, there are some instances, particularly in West Bank and Gaza, where there was a deliberate strategy for the government to avoid capacity substitution in the Ministry of Finance almost at all costs, um, uh, at, the, at the risk of alienating donors in the process. And th that seemed to have been vindicated over the medium term by the government now being able to claim very strong ownership by the, by the reforms that they achieved. But then again, West Bank and Gaza is a middle income region. There is capacity that the government could draw on. That is not the case in, in many other places. Moving on to the, to the next slide. The, the, the second area is the relationship between PFM reform and external accountability. We assumed by, by, by looking at the textbooks that in theory there, there ought to be a very strong case for external accountability play, play, playing a very prominent role here. Not just in terms of improving the probity and the quality of the use of public funds, but also in terms of strengthening the legitimacy of the formal state that is being operated if there is a uh, formally legitimized legislature that is able to hold the executive to account. But as Ed has already mentioned, um, that pattern really didn't didn't hold up. We found very little evidence of external accountability working working out. It's it's not a priority for the for the executives, and we we found this to be really to the point that it's almost a missing link in the budget cycle in many countries. External accountability as a very very weak area. Next slide, please. And the final point, again, on service delivery, and this goes back again to the, to the point that we had this morning. Um, <coughs> in theory, there should be a strong incentive for, for post-conflict governments to, to invest very heavily in service delivery as a, means to, well, as a means to improve the lives of its own population, but also as a means to improve its own legitimacy mm -hmm. by being visibly a provider of services to, to the people. We, we cannot really find any systematic evidence linking those two areas together. There's, there's no evidence that in the countries where PFM performance improved strongly over, over a period of years that service delivery would inevitably follow or that service delivery would actually follow at all, that trend of improvement. And um, there's also just qualitatively looking at the interviews that we did with people in ministries of finance, with senior government officials, Improving service delivery is not an immediate, very often not an immediate priority for PFM reformers. It might very well be an immediate priority for the head of government, but not necessarily for the budget director or people in the Ministry of Finance. Even though in the long run you would assume that strengthened proper public financial management systems that are better able to get funds from the center to frontline service delivery units would actually improve service delivery in the medium term. But that is, if you are a center of government official who is mostly concerned about centralizing authority over the use of public funds, that's almost a, uh, a positive externality, not the point of the whole exercise. And with that, we are going to move on to the implications of the entire study. And if if you properly paid attention, everything that comes up for the second time now, those are the things we thought were really important. Um, the, the first conclusion that we would draw is that there are no standard reform sequences that we could really recommend. Um, we, we have to keep in mind that this was a study of only eight countries, and so we might have biased ourselves by the selection of cases that we looked at, but there, there's so much complexity and so many differences between countries that whilst there are obviously certain sequences within discrete PFM reform areas, you wouldn't be able to come up with that blueprint that tells you if you, if you have this and this and this, then you do that, that and the other thing. Um, we also found very little evidence that very long-term multi-annual reform plans were in any way feasible or realistic. In those areas where things worked out quite well, 
they usually work quite out quite well by prioritizing heavily and then following through over a period of uh, the number of years that you can count off with one hand. Um, the the second the, the third point is that we think instead of thinking of political commitment as a rather abstract and monolithic thing that magically exists or doesn't exist, it makes a lot more sense to think about the incentives for and against PFM reforms by specific actors in the PFM system. And what that means specifically is that there might be some actors which are in favor, some actors that are against. You need to figure out which ones those are and then try to see what reforms might be feasible if they are being carried forward by those particular actors. And this is, this is going to have implications for the ways that donors engage in, in, in those sorts of countries. And, and, and perhaps the presentation that we heard from um, the distinguished minister from Somaliland this morning speaks, speaks to this issue very much. Next slide. Um, now, bearing in mind that we just said that everything is different and you can't really generalize across cases, we are still going to generalize across cases just a little bit um, to, to point out a couple of patterns that we thought important. Um, the first one is that budget execution reforms really seem to be able to gain traction more likely in, um, than budget preparation reforms, even if they do become quite advanced. That does mean, um, in turn, that we really didn't find any evidence whatsoever that fo focusing on advanced budget preparation reforms makes a lot of sense. The, the, the MTEF reforms and the, the performance budgeting reforms that we, that we saw were probably not wise investments in hindsight. Um, the sixth point, um, changes to the legislative framework of PFM should not be an early priority unless you have very good reason to think otherwise was already made by Ed as well. And and the final point, um, which is sort of a recurring theme throughout the entire presentation and again also brought up this morning is that um, it, it makes sense to start thinking of pay and, and, and civil service reform, civil service management issues early and often throughout the entire process. There was not a single country that we had in our sample that wasn't struggling with attracting and retaining capable staff in, in their key posts and key ministries. And I'm going to leave it at that and open it up for the discussion.